Welcome to this week's episode of The Period Panel. I'm delighted to welcome Shelley Hackett, expert in health and fitness and lecturer in a New York college. Shelley, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me on today. I'm so excited for this. So, you know, loads and loads about the menstrual cycle and we want to touch on that. Um, you know, women know that they have a menstrual cycle, but can often find it difficult to understand. So can you help us break it down for people? Absolutely. Um, so I am, I'm very passionate about women's health in general. And I feel like with the menstrual cycle, even ourselves as women, we don't have a great handle on the knowledge and the education around it. Um, I feel like it's still a subject that is quite taboo. Anyone who is in my company, I will always bring it up. I definitely want to push and try and get this to be a more normalized conversation. Um, women in general have over 400 menstrual cycles in their lifetime. So, you know, everyone, ex every woman goes through this, every woman experiences it. So it definitely should be um, a topic that we should start to feel comfortable mm -hmm. talking about for sure. Um, so the way I like to explain the menstrual cycle, and again, I keep it in a very kind of basic terminology. There's a lot of phases, a lot of hormones involved, but I think if we just have like the general understanding and knowledge, it can be such a game changer, right? To how we feel on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so even by just, so first of all, the cycle itself is not like our week of bleed, right? Or period, right? Our cycle mm -hmm. is literally from day one, right the way through until we start our next cycle, which is day one. And our cycles can vary based on individuals, right? You could have a cycle of 28 days. Some women could even have a cycle of up to 35 to even 40 days. So everyone's very individualized in their whole cycle. So the way I think of it is, is just splitting it quite simply into two phases, right? You have the follicular phase, the first phase, and then the second phase is your luteal phase, okay? Now, in your follicular phase, your day one, which is your first day of a bleed, that is the start of your cycle, all right? The two hormones that play a huge part is estrogen and progesterone all right so estrogen is the hormone in that first phase right so from our day one bleed we start to see that estrogen hormone and we start to see it rise and rise okay so our hormones start off very low at the start of our day one cycle which makes sense if we think about how we feel on day one day two of our cycle our mood's low we feel tired we feel lethargic we want to eat more we crave certain types of food so it makes sense, right? Because our hormones are something that we actually can't physically control ourselves, right? But mm -hmm. in understanding your cycle, you can start to control some of the controllables, right? How do we actually treat our bodies during these phases based on how, on what we're going through and what we're experiencing? So on day one and two, you know, take, take time to chill out, kind of rest, relax, concentrate on eating good healthy foods right the quality of food even though we, we crave those salty sugary foods at that time even by making sure our bodies get nutritious food will make such a difference but as we go through that first phase so as we start to go through that week of a bleed we actually start that estrogen hormone starts to increase and as we head towards our ovulation which is literally the center of our cycle right so say if we take a 28 day cycle for instance Day 14 is our ovulation um, stage, okay? So those hormones are increasing so that they actually peak, estrogen peaks at the at that ovulation stage. Mm -hmm. Our physiology, physiology around uh, women's bodies is all based on reproduction, right? So when we hit that ovulation phase, technically our body is looking for a mate, right? We want to reproduce. So in that ovulation phase, you will see that our, as our hormone or estrogen increases, our mood starts to increase. We start to feel a bit more outgoing. We start to feel good about ourselves. We start to feel confident. We want to move around. It's a very social time in our cycle, right? Because we are technically looking for a mate. So in that period, you'll start to feel like you're Wonder Woman. That's your most powerful part of your entire cycle. That's when you'll feel mo most confident, um, as you say, most sociable, most chatty. So it's a really, really enjoyable part of the phase. Now, as we come out of ovulation, progesterone, which is another hormone, it's a hormone that chills us out. So it works very opposite to what estrogen works, that works in our body as, right? So it kind of wants us to go into this hibernation mode, essentially. So if we technically have fertilized an egg and ovulation, then progesterone in our second phase is trying to protect us, trying to make us rest and recover in case that we are 
you know, we, we do have another human in our bodies. So at a certain point, you will start, that hormone will start to decrease again. Now, when our bodies realize that we, that egg hasn't fertilized, that's when we dip back down into the low hormones again, of course, estrogen and progesterone, okay? So our hormones goes in ebbs and flows, and it's based on basically what's going on in these two cycles, the middle point being that ovulation phase. Mm-hmm. Does that kind of all make sense? Yeah, I know it does. And I think it's it's good to explain how it goes up and down on the, the center point for people. And it might explain to a couple of people as to why they feel the way they feel at, at certain um phases of their of their menstrual cycle as well yeah Um, absolutely and it's and it's phases that we can't really control right we can't control these hormones our whole body is is made to reproduce so it's got a job to do and we're just riding that wave right so as i say what we can do is can kind of control the environment whenever we're feeling like that so Mm -hmm. again on your day one day two when both hormones are pretty low you want to hibernate you're tired you know just take that time to rest that's not the time where you're going to want to be doing your hit site session or a real long um, endurance run. Like you want to be doing some kind of movement, but listen to your body and accept that my body's going through a lot right now and I just need to fuel it and also rest it during this phase. Okay. Cause when you start to come out of that phase and head towards ovulation, that's when you start, your body starts to pick up hormones are going the right way. You're going to feel more energy then you maybe want to look at different types of exercises that you feel mm. that you can do then. So if I was to do a resistance class, I might feel like, hey, I can lift a little bit heavier in this in this class today or in this in these few days, right? I'm feeling stronger. I'm feeling better about myself. But as I start to come off that high after ovulation again, if no egg has been fertilized, then I'm going back down. I'm going to decrease mm-hmm. the gain in that hormone. So then I want to like check in and be like, okay, well then I'm not going to maybe get that same workout. I'm not going to feel that good about myself. Just like tune, dialing into your body, your period, your menstrual cycle in general is I think it should be considered a vital sign. Like the way you get your blood pressure checked, Mm -hmm. the way you get your pulse checked at the doctors, you should be tracking and talking openly about your menstrual cycle and the different phases that you're in, because that's a window into your overall health, right? Our menstrual cycle can tell us a hell of a lot about our health um, of our actual bodies. Yeah. And in terms of that tracking, like what would, like, have you a go-to app that you use or do you do it on pen and paper or... How do you you track your cycle and what kind of notes would you be taking? So I'm kind of old school. I do like the pen and paper. It's just that my cycle, it does, I vary a lot um, within my cycle, like especially someone who was on oral contraception for so long um, and coming off of that, it it takes a little while to kind of really get the true reading off your cycle. Mm -hmm. So for me, I like pen and paper because it's not always textbook one cycle to the next, but it does give me a very uh, like a a good idea roughly of what it's like I have used multiple apps before and there's some phenomenal ones out there um I just find that sometimes the apps can prompt you to feel a certain way and it kind of almost like at least when I'm writing down pen and paper I'm truly writing down my thoughts and my feelings where sometimes if I read them the app I'm like oh maybe I do feel this way and I might not at all do you know what I mean Yeah, yeah but Honestly, as long as you're tracking at all, whether that is through app, pen and paper, as long as you have some kind of like dial in on your cycle and you can have some measurable on it, then you'll be able to understand it and make better decisions around it. So it's kind of optional, whatever works best for you, as long as you just start to kind of education is knowledge. So the Mm -hmm. more that you start to track this, see patterns the better you'll be able to perform around different parts of your cycle because you'll understand physiologically what's going on. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I think that's an important thing for each person to do because obviously um, everybody's experience is different. Like I know, what, um, you know, for some people they can feel uh, ready to rock like two days before their period starts and they're like, okay, I'm like Wonder Woman at this stage in their cycle. Like I've spoken to a couple of different people and um, sometimes they feel like invincible like two days before their period starts and then you know it, it can be different for them like during their period and that type of thing so um, I think the best thing obviously is to like learn about yourself and mm-hmm. to take those like personal notes and everything yeah um, like terms- everyone is so individualized so as you yeah. say you're going to experience it's not textbook right so even though yes in theory we should be feeling great coming up 
to ovulation because that's the way our bodies you know mm-hmm. we're looking for a mate we're looking to be social we you know we're, we're feeling good about ourselves and um, but again that's we're not all textbook it's just to kind of mm-hmm. give you an indication of you know very stages off the cycle and how you might be feeling Mm -hmm. so having like being so individualized having your own tracker you're not going to be the feeling the same as what your friend feels your sister feels in their cycle and again going back to what I said earlier it's not a textbook 28 day cycle either some people have shorter like 21 days Mm -hmm. some people have longer like 35 40 days so you really need to to tune into like your own individual cycle in order to get a true reading of it all and in terms of when it comes to like sport and exercise, like what impact can this have? So they are doing a lot of research around this subject at the minute and the menstrual cycle and how it affects women in sport. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. it's all relatively new in, in, in research. Like even in recent years, we're really just looking at women in sport in general and how we differ from men. The menstrual cycle and how it impacts performance, that's still so relatively new. Thankfully, they are pushing and pushing to get more information mm-hmm. around that. Um, but again, my advice is, okay, we don't have blueprint of how our cycle affects us in performance, right? But if we are tracking an individualized um, tracker for ourselves, then we will get to learn how we perform in an individual basis, right? So I know coming up to my um, ovulation that most of the time I do feel like, I'm in my best shape and I'm in my fittest. That could be a confidence thing as well. So if I have football games around that time, I'm pretty confident that I'm going to feel feel good, right? And, you know, for so many years, me playing sport and I went out and had, like, say, a bad training session or a bad game and it wasn't really my skill set. What was really going on was my body. And like, I was just mm-hmm. lethargic or I was at a certain part of my cycle. So like understanding where I am in my cycle individually and um, kind of helps me not give myself as hard a time if I have those you know training sessions or games where I'm just not feeling it and I feel that like you know as women we do give ourselves a hard time because we compare ourselves to men's sport who have all this research and it's just there's just not enough information out there to really like define like definite research to say no this is why in relation to your Mm -hmm. menstrual cycle but they are working extremely hard to get more solid um, quality research around that so I'm excited to see how that will look in like five yeah. six years time um, and how we really can maybe optimize our performance based on our cycle at the moment we can presume right how we perform during our cycle but we don't have that hard evidence to say yeah. actually you should be you know at your maximal performance at this point of your cycle so I'm excited to see the research and um, that's going to come out in that but like everything it takes money and resources so I don't think it's something that we're going to find out in the next year or two but at least we are moving that way yeah no, there's definitely a lot of a lot of research going on and there's so much to be learned um again like everybody is is different but hopefully we get some sort of information that can kind of guide people mm-hmm. in terms of um at different phases uh during your cycle as well like there can be different uh like physical changes and kind of psychological impacts as well so um i know i was talking to a football coach before and they were talking about sometimes like concentration can be gone which can then uh impact people like depending on the sports that they're playing and um, they might be a little bit more t- prone to injury because their focus is actually maybe not there yeah. Um, and then also um, that, like, I think the shape of your hips and, and that can change as well, which can impact uh, people when they're playing sports. So um, that kind of, I suppose, puts maybe people on a pitch at higher risk and um, maybe than somebody in a pool. Um, and it's, it's just like something to be conscious. So what are some of the other things or or have you heard of those things and what kind of insight can you give? So, again, um, research is still coming to the forefront around injury and how that affects you know during our menstrual cycle and us Mm -hmm. as women um acl injuries there's a lot of research being done around that that women are at higher risk of that like three to six times i think is the rate higher risk of that injury than men and they their theory so far to date is that there's more laxity in the ligaments so basically at a certain point in the cycle um, there's more laxity so the ligaments are not as strong or as taut yeah. as what they are and that actually has been 
pr well, not proven completely, but their theory is that that actually happens around the going into the ovulation stage yeah, yeah. Which is funny because going into that stage, that's where you feel most confident, most strong, you know, things are going good. That hormone is, is peaking, but yet that's the point where we're at higher risk. So mm -hmm. again, just being cognizant about the type of training that we are doing during those times. Like I know with my clients um, and if I was doing like a lot of mobility work or flexibility work, I would definitely steer away from that during that part of their cycle, just because you could actually put them into like a further range of motion because their ligaments that laxity allows them to go further, but it's not exactly like a safe range to work yeah. in. So again, and this is like, you have to make that call as a trainer or a coach that even though everyone's not the same, just be mindful of these parts of the cycle where research at least to date, their theory around it is that um, and yes what you said too about you know your uh, body's being tired you're more risk of injury absolutely like those that, that kind of like day one day two where your hormones are low and you are lethargic you're going to make mistakes you're not going to be as quick off the mark concentration is going to lessen so again if you're on a pitch you can obviously just try your best but during those times i definitely wouldn't in my training sessions with clients i wouldn't be doing like plyometric work or power work during those early stages i would just adapt the training program and maybe switch it off based up on what my client is going through at that time um and you can kind of if you're coaching like a team sport the best you can do is just generalize it and mm -hmm. you know do your best talk the like communication is key so like I, one of the statistics out there is that 81% of women don't talk to their coach or trainer about menstrual cycles. So I feel that like, if you as a trainer or a coach have a great relationship and start talking more openly, like if you're training women, talk openly about the menstrual yeah. cycle so that if someone is feeling tired or lethargic or feeling that like, you know, they're not really up to the training session that you have planned. If they come and talk to you about that, then you can adapt that program for them. So again, it's just like getting like, getting it moving it away from being that taboo subject and just yeah, getting absolutely. people a lot more focal about it especially in these women's teams when you know any team i'm involved in like the girls laugh at me because if i'm not talking to them about their pelvic floor i'm talking to them about their menstrual cycle <laughs> so you know i just think that like i i got so starved off of growing up you know in my school and you know sex education wasn't quite where it should have been and you went through those teenage years very confused and very very lost and I just think that now there is such an opportunity and an easier way of getting communication out there through exactly what you're doing here through social media platforms and you know people they're you know they're they're bombarded with information but yet starved with knowledge so I think it's important that like you get real kind of cutting edge quality. research facts qu good quality information out there and help kind of steer these women into learning more about the physiology of their bodies because we really do need to understand what's what's going on inside us and like for me like I knew so little when I look back now in those teenage years and even my early 20s and how little I knew like it is crazy so I feel like that's where I get so passionate now about women's health is because I don't want people to go through and have you know not not understand what's going on with their bodies not understand how they're feeling and um, you know feeling low feeling high and but like by just tuning in and understanding the basics then you start to like realize your pattern and then you can control or at least understand those emotions that you're going through you know yeah, I know, like, look, in terms of like tracking, like obviously we're advising people to do that and, and take the notes and you can learn, you can learn so much about yourself and um, that then you can apply when it comes to, uh, you know, whether it's training or it's a, um, a game or whatever it might be and uh, hopefully equip yourself in the right way. Mm -hmm. In terms of, um, from your perspective, because I know you're working with clients um, that have, have different targets and goals and, you know, in terms of um, the weighing scales, like that can come in a lot. For people as well and, and in terms of body image and can negatively impact people and can demotivate people sometimes when they get really into numbers on the weighing scale so can you talk to us a little bit about that and how the menstrual cycle can impact that and um maybe educate people on on something that they might be completely misunderstanding uh, for years and years and years yeah i mean the scales is still we are moving away from that era where like we don't rely on the scales anymore again because of um, how women are made up in certain parts of their cycle, they're going to weigh heavier than others, right? So when I talk to my clients, I talk to them as a way of measuring if their goal is weight loss or even weight gain. Um, I do it by measuring inches around their body, right? Because mm -hmm. the scales during certain times of your cycle, especially in that first week of your bleed or in the run up to that bleed and um, day one, essentially, you people 
can weigh up to five pounds heavier on the scales. Like that is a crazy number. And if you got on the scales and saw that, it would really, if you were really dictating your weight loss journey by the scales, that could really, really throw you. But that's mm-hmm. not body fat weight, right? That is water weight. For you to accumulate a pound of fat, of body fat a week, you have to consume 3,500 calories. So you'd have to eat an extra 500 calories a day to accumulate one pound of body fat, right? So when you get on the scales and you weigh five pounds heavier, that's not body fat. You cannot Mm -hmm. put on that much weight in that short amount of time, okay? So it comes down to our hormones again and progesterone, right? Whenever we have an increase in progesterone, right? So whenever we're going into that hibernation phase or that second phase Mm -hmm. of our cycle, um, it actually causes kidneys to retain salt and water. That is water retention that is weighing on the scales. So the good news is it's very short term. You know, a a few days later, your scales are gonna become lighter. But the scales is not a measure of your success if you're on a weight loss or weight gain journey, whatever your goals is, right? So we need we really need to move away from using the scales because it can fluctuate so yeah. significantly, whether it's a pound or two pounds, or as I say, you can go up to five pounds in a single day. Um, so yeah, education around that and just try and even for for women again, talking, communicating with your clients, where are you in your cycle? This is why you're weighing heavier. Do not get disheartened. Some clients you just can't move them away from the scales. All you can do mm-hmm. is tell them to at least take a step back for those days around certain parts of your cycle where you will see that water retention and just educating them that as water retention and not body mm-hmm. fat and um, can go a long way. But it um yeah again it's just like as I say whenever I teach like what I do for a living is I teach in the college and I teach personal trainers coming through um and as I say to them like you know educate your clients on just moving away from the scales because as women we're going to fluctuate if we're measuring ourselves by the Mm. scales and a lot of it's just like habit and our go-to but like you know even how they feel in their clothes as I say take their measurements of inches off them like they're going to see better results that way um than jumping on and off the scales so Again, hopefully in the future, it's something we're moving further and further away from as a, as a measurement of, of, you know, body fat, or as I say, your actual journey that you're on. Yeah, no, I think it is important for people to understand that like you will fluctuate because Mm -hmm. of your menstrual cycle. I know a couple of people take the approach of, you know, analyzing week one of your cycle in comparison to week one of your next cycle, week two to week two, week three to week three. Yeah. Um, managing it from that perspective whether it's on the weighing scales or whether it's um you know with a measuring tape yeah um, it's it's a fairer comparison I suppose depending on what somebody's goals are as you said whether that's weight gain weight loss and you yeah. know, whatever whatever that might be so and in terms know, of even with people like who are just so you know they really really want to stick with the scales in that case I would have them then as you say not measure on the same week every month like measure yourself a couple of times during the week or every every week so that you can actually see right around certain times your cycle you're going to see that like two pound gain three pound gain and then it then starts to become like more normalized for them where they're like oh now I see a pattern it's not body fat it's it's water weight essentially Mm -hmm. so in terms of um learning about our bodies and and understanding them what are some of the tips that you would have um to manage different times of the cycle I know things like food and that and, and your nutrition can come into it yeah um like the sleep plays a massive part so whenever we go through that second phase whenever our progesterone is quite high um listen to our bodies our body is it progesterone is a calm and a hormone right so it's going to make us sleepy it's going to make us tired like really hone in on that and try and um, get as much sleep as you can during that part of your cycle it's what your body's craving it's what your body needs nutrition is a big thing too um especially in that phase whenever we avoiding foods that cause like in- inflammation Mm-hmm. Um, also drinking water. I know we retain a lot of water, but it's still important to keep hydrated. Um, yeah, so sleep, recovery, rest, nutrition, and just looking at the type of nutrition that we we take, right? So as I said before, going into that kind of like week or period, you want to create the salty foods and the sugars and that. But if we're already retaining water and salt, right, we want to avoid those adding on more salty foods. So even though we are craving those things, if we can just get more nutritional food into us, will make such a big difference. And even again, adding on more water weight or feeling 
a little bit more crappy because it's not good quality nutritional food that you're fluent filling yourself with so it's kind of um making those kind of choices also vitamin c is a great um supplement to take or a great source of nutrition to have because it acts as a diuretic so if we do have water weight it will help us urinate that extra excess water out um, and magnesium has been an important supplement that has came to light in recent years and um, it can actually help uh, decrease stomach acid or the low stomach acid so basically if our stomach acid is low we start to bloat more right so if we take magnesium on board it can produce the normal amount of stomach acid which actually works at decreasing us feeling, um, us feeling so bloated so a few little things that you can change or keep an eye on during certain times based on mm -hmm. how you're feeling um will definitely will definitely help with different stages of the cycle that was very educational and informative anyway. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to add, but you've certainly answered a lot of questions for me and hopefully for the audience. Yeah, no, I, as I say, this is great to, to have a platform like this and to start educating like young girls coming through. And like, as I say, my experiences at school and even playing sport, times where I wanted to give up on sport because I felt so uncomfortable going through my cycle at different times and not really understanding my body. Like mm -hmm. you can see how younger girls are falling out of sport because of what their bodies are going through in that like you know that 12 13 14 15 16 age you know there's a a lot of hormones at play and you know they're they're misunderstanding their body so even learning like these basic abcs can make such a difference and again just keep talking keep getting word out there you know again pushing for that like quality of research coming through where we can start to maximize on our performance get that blueprint to maximize in our performance based around our cycles it's going to be a game changer um in the next five or six years and i'm excited for it yeah same i'm looking forward to learning more and more over the next couple of years yeah. as they continue to do the research but thanks so much for taking the time to chat to us Shelley. oh you're welcome so good seeing you thank you so much for having me on the period panel is sponsored by Octavarn. Use the code HERSPORT30 to get 30% off.